a pleasure to have on stage Professor Ed Boyden. So it's useful to take a step back sometimes and think about why some problems are very difficult. And probably few problems are as difficult as understanding and repairing the brain. Why is that? We've made progress in many other parts of biology and medicine. Well, one thought is that the brain has a unique aspect which is very difficult to address. You have to simultaneously think about many scales at once, both spatial scales and temporal scales. A brain circuit is large, many centimeters, uh, even a single neuron can extend. But the connections between cells and the kinds of signaling molecules that transmit information and receive information are nanoscale in size. And so you have this enormous spatial range that you have to understand simultaneously in order to understand how information is flowing. <coughs> There's a second problem, temporal scale. So neurons in the brain are computing using very brief electrical pulses and chemical releases that are milliseconds in duration and precisely timed. And yet, if you want to think about a memory that you can recall since childhood or the progression of a disease like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, these processes span years, even decades. And so you have this enormous range of temporal scales that you also have to understand. So we have to build, we have to build tools that allow us both to observe and repair these kinds of processes, bridging scales. And that's why it's so difficult, at least one of the reasons. So I'm going to tell you three short stories today about technologies we've been developing and how they might be useful for allowing the mapping of the structure of the brain and not just the shape of the cells, but how the molecules are organized at their connections between them. And then we'll talk about dynamics. Can you see what's happening in the neural system of the brain in real time? And then finally, control. Can we repair a computation in the brain once it's been damaged? Sometimes people make the analogy between the brain and a computer. You know, if I want to fix this laptop, I need to be able to see what's going on dynamically. I need to be able to change the computation. And of course, it'd be better, the more we know about what's inside, um, the more powerful our approach can be. So let's jump right in. How do we image a large 3D object with nanoscale precision? Well, we developed a strategy, uh, and this is work that's been led by two grad students, Faye Chen and Paul Tilburg, in the group, to try to make this possible. And the way we do it is we try to just blow up the brain to make it bigger. We take the molecules that form polymer chains in baby diapers, and this is a swallowable polymer. When you add water, the baby diaper material will expand enormously. So what if we can make those polymer chains right there, wending its way throughout a piece of preserved brain tissue? At the top, you can see a small piece of the mouse brain. And this piece of brain has uh, uh, been preserved. We, we then wash in the building blocks of the baby diaper polymer and then form long chains. But we form the chains in the tissue itself. These polymer chains are winding their way inside the cells, between the cells, around the molecules. And what happens then is you have a very dense mesh. And this mesh is about as dense, we think, as the size of biomolecules, proteins themselves. So when you add water, it'll physically blow up the brain and make it bigger. And that's what you see in the lower right. That's the same piece of brain a few hours later. It's increased by 100-fold in volume, about four and a half times in X, Y, and Z, all three directions. And what this means now is you can now image nanoscale things with relatively inexpensive microscopes or optics. So one big question you might ask is, well, does this mess up the shapes of things? And so we've been doing some very careful experiments where we image before expansion and then we image after expansion and try to compare. And so on the left-hand side, you can see some neurons in green and a purple haze that is the connections between the neurons. On the right-hand side are images of the brain after a four and a half fold expansion in all directions. We shrunk the images down though, so it's easier for you to compare by eye. And as you can see, if you zoom in all the way to that tiny little white square in the lower right-hand corner, you can see an individual connection between two cells. But rather than a purple haze, you now have a very clean distinction between the transmitting side of the neuron and the receiving side. So the impact now is that we can try to actually image neural architectures across all these scales. And because the magnification that we're doing is physical, not optical, we can use relatively inexpensive hardware to do it. And inexpensive means scalable. We potentially can use these uh, uh, inexpensive optics in large arrays to allow the mapping. There's another theme here as well. 
There are lots of strategies for trying to image small things. But we want to know not just the shapes of things, we want to know where the molecules are. There are roughly, you know, 20, 30,000 genes in the genome, and all those gene products equip neurons with information processing capabilities. They regulate the electrical dynamics and the chemical releases that occur. And so if you really want to understand the principles of neural circuit operation, we need to know how one neuron attains its fate. And so here you can see, again, uh, this image that I showed you in the previous slide. But now we can kind of see them all at the same time, the zoomed out scale at the top. And then in the, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see a quasi-zoomed-in scale, where you can start to see some branches of cells. And then in the lower right, you can see a zoomed-in all the way scale. And you can see discrete dots that represent the connections between cells. Now, those connections aren't just structural. The blue stain is actually indicating a presynaptic protein called, bas called bassoon. And the magenta stain is actually indicating a postsynaptic protein named Homer. The exact names don't matter. The idea, though, is that we can start to really map out where these biomolecules are and understand what makes a connection strong or weak or fast or slow. And to do that across an entire circuit might allow us to build up comp computational perspectives of what entire circuits are doing. So the implications are several fold. One thing is that if we really want to repair brain circuits, it'd be great to know how a perturbation of a given cell, whether it's with electricity or drugs, affects the rest of the circuit. Many brain therapies have side effects. And if we understand how information flow is perturbed, when we alter something in one part of a circuit, that could help us develop therapies that have fewer side effects. There's a second implication, too. If we can map circuits with not just anatomical detail, but molecular detail, it might suggest new kinds of computations that computers could do that recapit recapitulate functions that are difficult for existing software to do, but which our brains find natural. So to summarize this first part of the talk, we have a way of magnifying things physically now, not just optically. And we're now working to make the expansion factors even bigger and to take advantage of all that space by bringing in little barcodes that would allow us to classify a wide diversity of molecules in situ in the specimen. Now, the static wiring isn't enough. There are many computers just like this one, and they all have the same wiring. And right this instant, they're all doing different things. So we need to watch the dynamics as well. This is hard because, again, it is, it is very fast for biological time. Uh, milliseconds are amongst the shortest events that people typically think about in complex biological systems. And so in collaboration with Ala Pasha Vaziri's group, this is work co-led by Robert Prevedal and his group and Yongo Yun and ours, we've been trying to think about how could you image a 3D object like the brain, but as fast as possible. Now, if you want to image as fast as possible, you ideally would not have any moving parts. And so what you see here um, is a schematic of a microscope, but the microscope has one thing altered by it. It's altered in the same way that our visual system is, in the sense that we have two eyes, and each eye takes a different picture of the world, and that allows our brain to see in three dimensions. So if you look, you can see that this, uh, there's a little micro lens array in the middle of this microscope, and it's basically like a set of eyes. Each lens captures a different view of the world, except in, the case, in this case, the world is a small brain. So now you can image in 3D as fast as your camera will let you. Here's a worm that has 302 neurons, a relatively small nervous system. Each of the, of the 302 neurons has been genetically engineered with a molecule that will blink and emit light uh, when the neuron is active. And so now, using a 3D microscopy strategy, you can actually image neural activity throughout an entire nervous system. Now, admittedly, this is a small nervous system. And so uh, we're also working to scale this up. You know, this is a small fish brain, which has 100,000 neurons. A mouse might have a significant fraction of 100 million neurons, and the human brain 100 billion neurons. So there's a ways to go. But by mapping dynamics comprehensively, we can watch how the, the neural circuit evolves over time and how the information processing occurs. In conjunction with the wiring and the molecules, these data sets might be uh, combined in interesting ways to allow you to hone in on exactly the kinds of processing that's happening within a brain circuit. The final thing we want to do, of course, is to repair. And through that, we can try to control the brain. And you've already heard about how electricity can allow you to do things that small molecules can't. But light allows you to stimulate neurons if you make the neurons receptive to the light. This is a technology known as optogenetics. And of course, most neurons don't respond to light. So to make this happen, we've been scouring the Earth for molecules that allow you to convert light into electrical energy or electrical signals. Thankfully, it turns out that over the last several decades, a wide variety of such molecules have been found. Molecules that will 
pump positive charge out of cells or negative charge into cells, or to let positive charge flow down an ion channel gradient. What we've been doing over the last decade or so is finding molecules that can express in neurons. And neurons compute use electricity. These molecules convert light into electrical signals. So if we put these in a neuron and shine light on it, we should be able to turn it on or off. Now, one of the things we want to do with this brain mapping stuff that we talked about earlier is to make a parts list for the brain. How many kinds of cell are there? We know some of the cell types of the brain. And so let me just tell you about a couple examples of what people are doing with these optogenetic tools. In patients with narcolepsy, there's a small cluster of cells that dies off, probably because the immune, immune system attacks it. But an open question is, what's actually happening in the brain when these neurons are silent or gone? So this is work led by Akihiro Yamanaka's group. They made a transgenic mouse that expresses one of these light-driven neural silencers just in this small cluster of cells. And then, when they shine light on these cells, what you see in these plots, just focus on the top plot, is the mice start out awake. The y-axis is the probability of being awake. And then over uh, about 30 seconds after they turn the light on, the animals fall asleep. The light's being conveyed from a laser down an optical fiber, and the optical fiber is implanted in the brain. And the brain doesn't feel pain, so you can, you can do this in a behaving animal. So this allows you to prove that a given class of cell contributes to a given function right at a certain time that you care about it. In this case, they show that by turning off these neurons, the animals fall asleep, and therefore, these cells are directly involved. Let's show a second example. This is some work spearheaded by Chris Fiorillo's group. They wanted to study dopamine neurons. Dopamine neurons are often thought about as being the pleasure center of the brain, but as you've heard, there's a wide variety of roles they play in movement and a variety of other important functions. And so using another genetic engineering trick, slightly different from the one that the other team used, they made the dopamine neurons in the mouse brain sensitive to light. So now you can try to figure out you know, these complex neurons that are playing you know, roles in reward and maybe pleasure and, and movement. What does activating them really do? They implanted an optical fiber aimed at these, and by delivering a pulse of light down the optical fiber, they could try to test out what these cells do. They put the mouse in a small box. If the mouse went to the right-hand portal, shown by the blue dot, it would get a pulse of light. If the mouse goes to the other spot, shown by the black dot, nothing happens. And so here's a movie showing what the mouse does. It pokes its nose into a little portal, gets a pulse of blue light, does it again, does it again. And so the mouse is basically working for light. And so it shows that activating this set of cells is able to make the brain do more of what it was just doing. So this raises the question, if you have maps of the brain and you understand something about the dynamics and you have the ability to control neurons to make them do what you want, could this lead to new kinds of prosthetics that are very, very targeted? And as you've heard, targeting and specificity are very important for the brain, especially if you want to repair a specific computation. Well, there's some trends. As you've heard, electrical stimulation of the brain is transforming therapy. Now, these molecules are natural molecules, and so they're, to deliver them to a neuron requires a gene therapy. And gene therapies um, are fairly sparse in the medical repertoire, but one of them has been approved in, in Europe about a year ago. And so there's some hope there. These molecules also come from organisms all over the planet, and so one question is also, are they safe? And so we and others are also working to do preclinical safety testing to see what uh, their properties are. So just one example of the kind of thing that you could try to do in the space of nervous system repair is to try to treat some forms of blindness. In the retina, we have relatively good uh, and complete list of the cell types compared to other brain regions in the human. And so this is an appealing first target because we have some hypotheses about how cells function. So in many forms of blindness, the photoreceptor cells, the cells that capture light, are gone, and so patients can no longer see. If we zoom in on the back of the eye, now the photoreceptor cells are at the top, these patients have lost those cells. Now light can still get in, though, and so what if we took these light-sensitive molecules from these different organisms and installed them on spared cells of the eye and convert, basically, the spared parts of the eye into a virtual camera? Well, in some work that was led by Alan Horsager, um, we tested this. So here's a mouse solving a maze. It's a blind mouse, that's what that acronym means. And there's a bit of water in the maze because mice like to swim, but they'd rather sit and do nothing. If the mouse swims to the top of the maze, that's what it can do. It can navigate to a little platform and crawl out of the water and sit. 
And so this mouse can't see, so it takes some time to find that platform, and then it can get out. But it's not using vision to find it. Now here's a mouse that was blind a couple months beforehand and received one dose of a gene therapy vector that encodes for one of these light-sensitive molecules. And as you can see, the mice can actually navigate to the platform now. It doesn't necessarily prove that it has normal vision, but it does show that the mouse can make cognitive use of its visual information. And so now several companies are exploring how you could potentially do this in a clinical sense to treat human patients with blindness. So I'll end there. What we're trying to do is figure out how we can map the brain without making any assumptions if possible, which is never truly the case, but we want to get down to as close to the ground truth as we can. We want to record the dynamics of the brain so we can follow information flow and understand the principles of how neural circuits communicate. And then finally, to use that information, the maps and the dynamics, to build ultra-targeted ways of resculpting neural activity for prosthetic purposes, a topic we call brain coprocessors. And I'll end on this slide to acknowledge this is an enormous collaborative effort um, which spans many different disciplines, maybe all of them, and maybe we have time for a question or two. Thank you.